All right, uh, it's good to see everyone here again. I'm Alex Converse from Google. I work on uh, libvpx, vp9, and Alliance, of Open Media, Alliance for Open Media, vp10 stuff. I'm here today to uh, talk about what's new with vp9. I gave an update on vp10 last year. Uh, for those that don't know, I was part of this community before I ever worked for Google. I was hired out of this community. Uh, Google tries to support the open source multimedia community. And on a personal note, this is my fourth VDD, and it's really great to be back here. So, VP9 is part of the WebM project. And uh, the WebM project's goal is uh, royalty-free, high-quality, uh, open video formats. Uh, and the WebM project includes the WebM container and also the uh, VP8 and VP9 video codecs. Uh, WebM is also closely related to WebP, but I'm not really here to talk about WebP today. That's other people. So uh, VP9's been out for a while now. Uh, the VP9 first released in 2013, and uh, we've been doing stuff since then. So. Uh, Sort of, uh, Ronald gave the initial uh, VP9 talk at Google I.O. back in uh, May of 2013. And then over the summer, we released in Chrome and did a stable software release that fall. And then after that, we started uh, working on improving VP9 support. Uh, in 1.4, we added multi-thread support and uh, support for high color profiles. In uh, 2015, we made VP9 the default codec in libvpx, and we worked on speed quite a bit. And uh, this year, uh, we released version 1.6, and uh, we've continued to work on uh, decode speed and real-time encode performance, among other things that I'll get to. So uh, one thing that you all have been asking me for forever is a formal specification for VP9. And we actually have one of those now. Um, here it is. It should match the source code. If you find any bugs, uh, please report them to uh, our... <laughs> That's open to interpretation, let's say. This was uh, produced in a collaboration with Argon Design, though, who did a lot of uh, sort of mechanical verification work of it. So it should be pretty good. Um, and it's got uh, all the syntax tables you expect, all the boilerplate you expect. Like I was looking through the spec, and I saw this symbol. And it's like a horizontal line with a vertical line on top. And I said, I know I've seen that before, and I don't remember what it is. And uh, it's, it turns out it's addition. So, Good to know. So yeah, here's some of our very exciting syntax tables that I'm sure you love seeing. So let me go back to present. So we also have uh, formally defined levels now uh, to help uh, support various hardware decoders. Uh, it goes beyond level 3.1. If you go to our website, you can see the full table and the explanations of what some of these things mean. But it's another thing that people have been asking for us so that they can feel confident using uh, all of the wonderful VP9 decode hardware that's finally started to proliferate. Uh, we have some new transport options for VP9. Uh, we're continuing to invest in WebM, and we have a new WebM parser in C++11. But we understand that WebM isn't for everyone, and some people have large investments in other formats. Uh, we now have an official mapping for uh, ISO BMFF, which is also known as MP4, and it includes Dash support and common encryption support. Uh, there's also uh, some work in progress on uh, transport stream encapsulation as part of LibWebM. Uh, so if you're interested in transport stream, I recommend you check that out. Uh, as far as the VP9 ecosystem goes, Microsoft uh, launched support for VP9 in their browser, which uh, is something I thought I would never see. But uh, that was uh, just this past uh, summer as part of the uh, Windows 10 anniversary update. Uh, VP9 is uh, enabled in WebRTC, in Android, and in Chrome now. 
And in addition to sort of these uh, new uh, deployments, it's still good to remember that there's over a billion endpoints from uh, longtime supporters like uh, Chrome and Firefox and Opera and Android. So uh, getting a little bit more into the technical side, we've spent a lot of time working on libvpx decode. Uh, uh, we've gotten rid of a lot of uh, SS, supplemental SSE3 instructions that are slow on uh, sort of Atom and other low-end Intel chips, like uh, PShuf B on some of them takes five cycles. I think it's looking for the answer in Ulysses or something. Uh, Celeron uh, type chips benefited the most, but there have been uh, noticeable improvements on desktop as well. And some of the improvements also come from general refactoring. Like who would have guessed if you weren't making a ton of extra copies of stuff that would make your codec faster? <laughs> so here's a, uh, a graph of decode performance on a particular clip. I think this one is a game trailer. Uh, and it's indexed by git commit hash, which is a little bit weird. But basically it's April 1st, 2015 through uh, June 2016. And uh, it's frames per second, so up and to the right is good. And here's a, a different chip, but similar results. So uh, on the encoder, we've done a lot of uh, improvements to our rate control. Uh, we have a tighter rate control in VBR mode now, and uh, some control parameters so that you can uh, sort of uh, Try to adjust what your tolerance is if you're trying to shoot for uh, bit rates on single clip scenarios versus an entire corpus where really you don't care about where an individual clip comes in. Uh, we've improved uh, bit allocation, especially for uh, animated and graphics and uh, the low brightness, low contrast sort of things where there's a lot of banding. We have a lot of uh, sort of miscellaneous changes to it too, like getting rid of uh, very short alt ref groups towards the end of your scene, where you could have a, a long term reference frame whose long term is like four frames, so it's not really a long term frame. Uh, there were some two pass bugs in uh, 4K where uh, I think they were just overflows because you have so many pixels at that point, and uh, a lot of high bit depth fixes as well. So uh, we've brought Trellis back in our speed zero encodes and I'm starting to bring it back in speed one and speed two. Uh, we've made uh, our Trellis implementation a lot faster and more cache friendly. So it's actually like usable now. Uh, so we're doing uh, distortion in uh, the pixel domain now in a number of circumstances. Uh, Parseval's theorem says that you should be able to have the same energy in the transform domain and the pixel domain but that doesn't account for any of the rounding done inside of our transforms or any of the cropping uh, or any of the clipping to get back in a uh, valid pixel range. So doing this allows the encoder to uh, do a better job of figuring out the best way to encode a given block. Uh, smart. I can follow up and show you the commit where there's BD rate numbers attached to it. So uh, we're, what? In AV1? Yes, it is in, it's in VP10 definitely. I'm not sure if it's in AV1. All right. So uh, we've, uh, we're doing properly cropped distortion now on the edges uh, where uh, we have these 64 by 64 super blocks, but I'm sure that you know that uh, sort of commonly used resolutions are not divisible by 64, like 1080 is not divisible by 64. Uh, so as a result, you have sort of this overhang area at the bottom. And uh, one thing we were running into was that uh, you had something that predicted very nicely at the top and was all screwed up at the bottom. And the encoder would say, no, I don't want to use this because it's giving me a really bad error score. But all the error is isolated outside of the visible picture. So uh, in like bitrate starved scenarios, the encoder was spending a substantial fraction of its bitrate like on just those bottom blocks, which is kind of a crazy thing to do. So we've uh, fixed that and now we're cropping all of uh, these edge blocks when we're doing distortion. Uh, we have some uh, miscellaneous improvements to the encoder as well. We've increased the resolution of uh, 
how we're spending the bits, at, in our uh, entropy coder costs, uh, sort of the cost in bits of uh, sending a uh, one at probability zero of 254 was something like uh, one point, or it was uh, 2.8 times uh, two to the minus eight bits, and uh, the next uh, bin over was uh, sitting at like 1.4, so those rounded to uh, have a three to one cost ratio when the real ratio is two to one. So uh, we got uh, something like uh, half a percent just by increasing that resolution. We've uh, started to use a lot better uh, sort of uh, software uh, diagnostic tools from the compilers. We fixed uh, all of our uh, unsigned integer overflows that uh, occur in the test that were just results in the encoder making bad decisions here and there. Uh, we've uh, gone through and started fixing all of the 64-bit uh, or 64 -bit to 32-bit shortening problems in the codec. Uh, we've added an optional uh, screen content tuning to speed up real-time encoding. And uh, we're using the sharp filter now to uh, generate our alt refs, which gives better results there. Uh, at speed zero, which is sort of our highest quality uh, mode, we have a substantial speed up there. So if uh, you're interested in sort of uh, getting involved, if you want to make VP9 faster, want to make it even better, we are an open source project. All our code is available online. We have some mailing lists and an IRC channel on Freenode. And uh, that's it. Luca? Uh, just a question. Which is, will be your relationship with uh, anyone, anyone uh, since uh, the library is pretty much the same, but uh, you currently cannot use both at the same time? So the, where all of the codecs wind up in what libraries, I don't have a correct answer for that right now. Um, if you're running into uh, linkage errors, linking uh, uh, libaom and libvpx, like certainly uh, patches welcome. We would love to fix any of those. What about uh, Matroska? Have, are they including WebM or? So uh, the question was, what about Matroska? WebM is a subset of Matroska, and I believe our WebM mapping for both VP8 and VP9 is identical to the Matroska mapping. All right. <laughs>